In this video, I'll start by talking about impact noise, which is typically a problem with ceilings. That said, before we move on, I'd like to mention something about ceilings, which I probably should have mentioned on a previous video about walls and ceilings, namely the effect that the installation of the artificial lighting has on the sound isolating properties of a ceiling. The biggest problem is usually recessed lighting. These fixtures need to be sealed up just as with wall outlets and switches, and the thinness of the metal can which comprises the fixture is also a problem. A thick wooden box can be built, which is open on one end and installed above the drywall, and preferably not touching any joists. This box needs to be sealed airtight to the drywall and will serve as a housing for the recessed lighting. If you'd like to just forego the recessed lighting but want something other than a traditional fixture, you might consider pendant lights or even track lighting as the penetrations through the drywall are only as big as a typical light fixture electrical box. If adding extra layers of drywall to the ceiling, it's even more important to try to limit the amount and size of ceiling penetrations so that the extra layers are not circumvented by these weak points. The term impact noise is used to describe when a physical object comes into contact with a wall or ceiling partition. Now, when sound slams into the opposite side of a wall and causes it to vibrate, this really isn't that different from a drum being hit with a drumstick. So why the distinction? Because there are certain ways to improve impact noise reduction, i.e. someone walking on a solid floor with hard heels, that don't necessarily improve overall sound reduction. The most useful measure to reduce this type of noise is the use of carpet and carpet padding. Ideally, the carpet would be as thick as possible, and the underlayment padding as thick and especially dense as possible. Usually, rebond type padding is recommended and goes as dense as 8 pounds and as thick as a half inch. Area rugs can also be used for non-permanent installation, though they will be less effective unless padding is used under them. If extreme measure must be taken to alleviate impact noise at the floor level, an entirely new floor may need to be constructed. This floor would be heavy, thick, and resting on top of the original subfloor with resilient mounts. This type of floating floor typically allows a few extra inches of space between the floating floor and the subfloor for better sound isolation. A new or perhaps remodel construction could involve taking out the middleman of typically installed subflooring and still accomplish similar performance with less thickness, as it does away with the triple leaf. Now, double subflooring layers with damping glue in between the layers is always helpful, but with a floating floor of this nature, it's particularly useful since the edges of two individual layers can be staggered and screwed together, seeing as how they will not be held down to the joist. Make sure to use screws that are small enough that they don't go into the joist. Thus, the subfloor becomes the floating floor. Oftentimes, companies will try to sell a sound barrier, aka mass-loaded vinyl, of some sort to be placed on top of or in between layers of subfloor to create a floating floor. This has limited results, though it can be quite expensive. Do this only if you have little room to spare. There is no magic product for soundproofing. In any case, make sure that any and all air cavities contained between framing include insulation. This includes walls and ceilings, as well as added floating floors. Both open-celled foams and fiber insulation help to dampen sound by converting the energy of the sound waves into heat through friction. As sound waves move through the matrix of the insulation, the forward momentum of the particles is dissipated and converted into heat as the particles collide against themselves and against the insulation. Generally, most various types of open-celled foams or fibrous materials are about equal in terms of sound absorption. There are slight differences, but likely will not be enough to be noticeable, unless, of course, we're comparing very dense foam to a super lightweight foam that has so little density you can practically see through it. Rock wool slash mineral fiber is often touted as the must-use insulation for sound reduction. However, the effect is minimal over fiberglass despite clear differences in density and weight. Foam and fiber are used more specifically for the point of sound absorption from recording studios to home theaters, mostly just to reduce the echo for a cleaner sound, as well as in large rooms with lots of chattering people in order to help reduce ambient noise so that people don't have to talk so loudly over each other. Bass traps also absorb ambient noise, but are designed to absorb low frequency, as the name suggests. The typical design is a box with a thin, flexible panel on one side, which vibrates when impacted, 
and this vibration is dampened by an absorbent material contained within the box. Diffusers are often used as well, though they do not absorb noise per se. Instead, their irregular surface helps to break up the sound wave into multiple individual waves flying in all directions. This breaks up the power of a single solitary wave, converting it into inaudible ambient noise. Changing the way sound behaves within a room is sound conditioning, though it's often referred to as sound attenuation due to the fact that when people talk about sound being absorbed, they're most likely talking about the surface treatments used to reduce reverb within rooms for various purposes. However, bear in mind that these surface treatments are only effective at controlling the properties of the room space, and do little to stop sound from exiting or entering the room. Insulation, for example, is less effective at reducing sound transmission from room to room than it is at conditioning sound as an acoustic panel, since the sound only has to pass through the wall once to be heard at all. But just the same, the walls should be insulated with whatever insulation is cheapest, because several inches of it will still help to absorb a noticeable amount of medium to higher frequencies. Another benefit of insulating a wall cavity is that it dampens the vibrations of the wall panel, allowing some loss at low frequency, as well as pushing the low frequency residents to a slightly lower frequency. It is a good idea to insulate both walls of a double exterior wall construction anyway for heat retention, which is a green building technique called super insulation. Oftentimes double walls are only built for this purpose.